Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll be talking about nonprofits that engage in early childhood education with guests, Tori Manis, President and CEO of, of the Child Care Group in Dallas, Mira Peralta, uh, President and CEO of Centronia in Washington, D.C., and Bill Sperling, President and CEO of Child 360 in Los Angeles. So just to set this up, thank you all for joining us. It's, it's just wonderful to have you here to talk about uh, children, early childhood education. Um, so just to set this up, uh, early childhood education improves the school experience for children through a holistic approach that supports ch uh, a child's social, emotional, cognitive, and physical learning, and it's very difficult to do at a distance. So let's talk a little bit about how we have coped during this pandemic time where we're, we're kind of captivated by these kind of Zoom um, interactions where uh, in-person in learning uh, can be very difficult. Uh, Tori, can we talk about how you've experienced this whole pandemic, how your people, how your children have experienced this, this uh, pandemic, how their parents have experienced this pandemic and how you've navigated and where you are now? Sure. I like to say that the early childhood professionals in around our country truly are the workforce behind the workforce. And throughout the last 16 months, we've really been standing on the front lines, just as our health providers have, delivery drivers, et cetera, to provide care for the children of those who really had to work. So for Child Care Group, our programs, uh, we offer two different kinds of programs. Our early Head Start and Head Start programs closed with the ISDs when they closed back in March. Um, we, uh, our teachers really uh, moved quickly to a virtual platform. They began teaching online, but we soon discovered that most of our families did, lived in areas that didn't have good broadband access. So we were fortunate to be able to raise the funds to purchase uh, laptops and hotspots to help provide these families the opportunity to stay engaged with us. And then after realizing that they were no longer, you know, we were providing diapers, wipes, and two meals and a snack every day, we realized our families were really struggling with those extra costs. So we did a combination of drive-by and then deliveries of diapers, wipes, food. We sent educational supply gift cards to the families so that they could purchase supplies at home. And we provided um, virtual learning kits with all the things that families needed to stay engaged with us. And so we've been keeping that up for the entire you know, time, um, as well as increased mental and behavioral health support services. We've realized how vulnerable our families are and how much they're struggling. So we really stepped up our services and outreach to children and families and our staff in mental and behavioral health. This is such an important point. It's very clear this pandemic has made it very clear that we have a systemic issue when it comes to children without means, right? It's, it's kind of hidden because we've kind of accepted it. Uh, parents who are not able to drive their kids to a particular facility because they don't have gasoline or whatever, but we kind of have figured that out. But now with this dislocation, it becomes very clear when parents don't have means to um, provide broadband access when they don't have computers, when they, uh, they might have to stay home from jobs and so their income dips so that they don't have wipes and they don't have uh, food. So uh, Myrna, can you, can, can you talk a little bit about how you're experiencing that piece? Because it seems to me that what's going on is that you've, you've suddenly become, from being educators, you're now frontline workers as whole swaths of our child landscape enter into crisis. How, how have you responded uh, where you are in Washington? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for, for having me. Uh, uh, I want to second uh, uh, much of what Tori said in terms of uh, uh, child care providers sort of stepping up big time. Our experience and um, uh, since we focus on infants to, you know, to pre-K, um, uh, our experience has been that the demand and the, um, uh, the expectations of our community is that we would be there. 
Uh, and it, it's interesting how when the pandemic first, I mean, hit its stride uh, last year, um, uh, parents were, uh, especially once again, your emergency frontline, your nurses, your doctors, your, you know, uh, uh, retail, uh, your firemen, your police, um, the expectation um, was that we would continue to operate. And it, it is, it, we when we rose to the occasion, uh, but the um, uh, but the experience has basically uh, re-emphasized what we've known all along that there's a huge disconnect between what uh, what communities sort of uh, uh, expect of childcare and the systemic inability to really respond to what is needed to keep our children safe, our staff safe, our centers operating. Uh, and that disconnect has just, I mean, has just widened. Um, uh, it's, it's a disconnect between res expectations and resources, right? I mean, the, the fact is, is that when the expectation is that you're operating here, yeah. but the resources are down here, yeah. it's-, and, it's that, and like I said, that gap has always existed. I, right. Uh, this is not a money-making machine. <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, as my CFO says, we work on no margin at all. So, you know, uh, and so the the pandemic has just really uh, uh, put a huge spotlight on the fact that this is an industry that has extraordinary responsibility. Um, uh, you can imagine when, you know, a, a parent holds hands, hands over to us or six month old, that they expect that we have everything in place to keep that child safe. And yet um, our ability to, uh, to uh, generate the revenues from parents that it costs us to provide the service is just not there. Uh, there's no way we can put on parents the expectation of a $30,000 a year infant care, okay? I mean, it, it, so that the, the, the economics of it have always existed to the detriment of the providers and parents. Um, and this pandemic has just really put a huge spotlight on that. And I, Bill, I know that, that you agree with uh, Myrna and Tori from our interview that we did over at uh, KLCS over in Los Angeles, the PBS station there. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, though. Um, my big question is whether we Americans, whether we have children or not, whether our children are grown or not, whether it means or not, do we have a responsibility to American children? Um, I mean, do we have a responsibility to support children who are not our own, right, who are, uh, are living in a different part of the country? might be um, of different circumstances, a different race, a different religion, a different gender. Do we have a responsibility to those children collectively as a country to ensure that that generation has uh, the, the infrastructure, the support? You know, everything's political nowadays. We're talking about investing in education and we're calling it infrastructure. Do we have a responsibility in this country here to, to support uh, those youngsters? I don't think it's responsibility. I think it's a mandate. I, I don't know as a country or as a culture how you could say I'm not responsible for those around me. I, I, I don't know as a community how that works. And whether you define it as a municipality, a county, a state, at some point you have to look around and say we are all in this together. And whether as we have in California, children are here documented or not, whether they are here with means or not, it, it's not going to matter that this is the generation, this zero to five population is the generation that is going to be solving the problems that unfortunately we create. And so if we're not going to invest in them, if we're not going to take care of them, whether you think it's a moral imperative or not, I happen to think it is, it's an economic one, it's a social one, it, it's just a common sense one, unless someone has a better idea of who's going to run things when they get older. I, I haven't seen it. I think this is the, the, the cycle of it. So we're either going to invest in it now, and the, and the economic studies all show this. You either invest your, your dollars now, 
or you pay sevenfold later on yeah. with high school uh, dropout rates, incarceration rates. We are in fierce competition with a number of other countries for engineering positions, for, for all that next thought uh, capital that's coming. Uh, we have to do this. And if we don't, you know, the, the Department of Defense sees this as a national security issue. And when you ask folks at the Department of Defense and why the military invests so heavily in early care and education, they see this as a national security issue. Because who is even going to do those more increasingly complicated jobs? Life is not getting easier. Life is getting more complicated. And we've found that if you don't have children ready for school, they are not going to do well in society. And, and this is, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but this is actually a crisis. And, what the, and, and the crisis that's going on is not only with the children, but the workforce, which is where Child 360 mostly comes in and supporting the workforce. In LA County alone, there's going to be a shortage of 34,000 ECE teachers. In California, we had 4,000 licensed facilities shut down due to a uh, pandemic, and they're not coming back. Right. And so what are we going to do about the workforce that is going to actually help these kids? The legislature has stepped up. I have to say in California and federally, there's been a lot of money pouring into ECE, and that's great. The problem is there's not going to be enough qualified uh, adults, qualified teachers and professionals who are going to be able to, to develop and administer these programs. And so all the great intentions in the world are not going to help if we don't also as a society come to grips with what we pay these adults, what we pay these teachers, yeah. how we support them. If we don't have people coming into this field and soon, we're going to lose whole, what I call mini generations, whole cohorts of four and five-year-olds. Um, and, and we're just gonna get further and further behind. You know, one of my favorite sayings is there's no such thing as a free lunch, Tori. So uh, the real question ends up becoming, um, we have a pension in this country for loving investment as long as we don't have to pay for it. As long as somebody else pays for it, it's great. When we have to pay for it, we start getting all frowny faced. How do we look at this? Because um, if you look at the, the different states, uh, Texas, for example, in, in your area, uh, property taxes can be higher, and that pays for education. State income taxes are much lower than in California, right? So you end up having uh, education aligned to where property taxes are high because that's where the money is, right? Other states have different different ways of, of, of doing this. It seems to me that we have this patchwork of systems and it's just collectively not working particularly well. How do you see how we should function as adults, as adults in the room who know that we have to pay for what we get? There's no such free thing as a free lunch. Where do we put our money? How do we solve the problem that Bill is, is describing in California and in Texas and in, in Washington? Well, I agree 100% with Bill. I think this is a moral imperative of our society. I think we've had a social awakening during the pandemic. And this is the time that we have to get it right right now. This is our moment. And I think luckily, all the science is behind us. All of the research on infant brain development shows that the first five years of a child's life are absolutely crucial for setting the foundation for all later learning. And so we know that we have this incredibly important period of time in the first five years. And it's when you're to your question mark of, you know, how do you afford it? It's either pay now or pay more later. We know that when we invest $1 in the education of a young child, we can save up to $13 later on in saved investments in social Is services. Is your point that we're going to pay regardless? Yes. Absolutely. So it's not about paying. It's about how do we use whatever dollar we spend most effectively, right? Yes, yeah. let's use our dollars as wisely as possible when we can make the biggest impact and try to make sure that children get a good early start in life. And it shouldn't be determined on their zip code, their ethnicity, their background. Every child deserves that opportunity. And parents really need options for the care and education of their young children. Um, you know, Bill made the comment that, that um, uh, at least in L.A., they have stepped up on, on supporting the you know, ECE uh, programming during this time period. It, D.C. has been extraordinarily uh, generous um, uh, in its sort of uh, infusion of dollars to 
to prop up our early learning community. The issue is going to be sustainability. Once the pandemic passes, uh, what we cannot do is go back to pre-COVID uh, uh, systemic uh, issues. And that's the real challenge, I think, for us, uh, for us as a provider, for those who are advocates, for legislatures, is how do we use this window that we have been given to figure out how do we sustain the current level of, I think, very important support during this pandemic? How do we bring that into the future? Um, and there are all sorts of uh, opportunities that legislatures have and uh, the advocacy community is really pushing really hard both at the federal and state and local levels to say you're we're doing we're doing the right thing by our uh, providers right now um, I think uh, Bill made the comment about staffing it is probably the singular uh, biggest issue. Uh, how do we retain our teachers? Uh, you know, we're asking uh, our teachers who themselves have children, okay, and uh, to work in a job that barely, you know, meets the minimum wage in many jurisdictions. And how unfair is that? I mean, if we don't take care of our staff, uh, uh, all of the money in the world going into supplies and programming is not going to take us anywhere because we can't licensing requires we have so many teachers per child and so uh and that's not negotiable and it shouldn't be we want to have enough staff that are qualified to make sure our children are safe uh, but if we can't get folks to see child care as a credible and feasible and a uh, uh, career that they can enter into to sustain their families, we're not going anywhere. And so the compensation issue for our staff uh, is, is huge, um, putting aside all the operational challenges that those of us who do this every day face. You know, Myrna, it strikes me that sometimes we don't think in terms of a return on investment, right? When, we, when we're talking about an Amazon worker, we know what the return on investment is because we're all ordering stuff on Amazon, particularly during the pandemic. So we asked a question, what is the positive impact of ECE programs? And really what we're saying is what is the return on investment? What is the ROI yeah. in these programs? And the answers were very interesting. Emotional intelligence, increased emotional intelligence was a bit was a big response. Uh, better academic outcomes, also a big response. But then we also had improved uh, health, improved interaction with peers, improved social skills, and so on. So we have uh, a, a whole range of returns. Uh, Bill, um, does that track with, with your experience of kids that go through these ECE programs that are able to uh, have the benefit of, of, of your programs versus uh, kids who, who uh, don't? What does the data tell you about the ROI, the return on investment? Let's talk about investors as adults of these programs? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think as Tori and Myrna may uh, agree, um, ECE is a little bit problematic in reducing it down to a number because we're not talking about learning letters as the ultimate goal. It's not talking about learning your math as the ultimate goal. Zero to five is a really important stage because a lot of this is about social emotional intelligence. It's about things that are harder to measure. But I will say this, and I think um, panelists will agree, one of the ways you can track this is you simply go into a kindergarten class and you ask the kindergarten teacher, can you point out which kids have been to an ECE program, a good ECE program? And they can do it. Within a couple of weeks, they can say, yes, 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 no. And if you have a lot of kindergartners in particular who have not had a quality ECE experience, that's going to make that kindergarten class different, I'll say. And it's going to stress that kindergarten uh, uh, teacher and staff to adjust to and handle having to bring the, the kids who didn't have benefit of these quality ECE programs up. And so that means the kids who did have the benefit of an ECE quality program are also affected by that. 
So it, it doesn't, I don't mean to make it sound anecdotal because I think that's an actual really good indicator. But yes, for scientists who have studied this and for folks who have tried to reduce this to a couple of numbers, they all have shown that in order to be ready to learn, and kindergarten is about starting to learn, and you do learning in ECE too, but ECE is getting ready to learn. You have to have continuity of care. You have to have an intentional program. You have to have all of these things in place so that that child is ready for kindergarten, ready for school. And however you want to measure it, uh, and I don't have the, the studies in front of me, but I guarantee you they all say the same thing. A quality ECE program absolutely does it. And kindergarten and K through 12 will tell you we absolutely need it. And so it's frustrating to hear that almost one in six ECE teachers meets poverty level. One in six. Um, and, and how do we have quality ECE programs when the ECE providers themselves are struggling to put food on the table, are struggling with the very same issues that a lot of the families who are receiving the subsidies are, 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 are experiencing. It's a, it's a really vicious cycle. And, um, and K through 12, I think if someone was here from that would say, please more ECE, because that helps our K through 12 program with expenses as well. I also, I also think that the, 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 the ROI has to also be measured in terms of the value to the parents, not just to the children, because the, uh, the availability of quality child care, uh, you know, means you can have more women in the workforce for the most part. It means that parents are missing less uh, uh, time off work. Um, it, it, it means that, that the parents are in a position to uh, make career and professional choices that they wouldn't they, if they didn't have the confidence and availability and affordability of child care. And so the, the, the return on our investment is not just as it is a benefit to the children, but also to the, to the parents and the families as a whole. I'd love to piggyback on that, too, and mention one other thing. First, I agree with both Myrna and Bill on the importance of this. I like to think about early childhood education as sort of the first baton in the educational relay race. Our goal is to prepare these children to get them ready for success in school. And then we pass the baton on to the kindergarten teachers and the other teachers who take over later. But the important element too that has not been raised is the importance of parents parent engagement in the educational process. Parents are their child's first and lifelong teacher. And I think in those early years, strong ECE programs really reinforce that with parents to bring them along, help them understand how to be engaged in their child's learning, understand the various stages of child development, and learn how to be an advocate for their child throughout their school lives so that they are involved and advocate for what their child needs as they progress through the, through the educational system. That's such an important point. The whole idea of, of helping parents be good parents, right? We don't have parent education classes, but this is a form, this interaction with educators, people who have dealt with, with dozens and dozens and dozens of children. That's a very important skill set that a parent does not naturally necessarily have. So being able to be part of that community, receive some advice uh, and learn just by observation through those interactions is so incredibly important. You know, it strikes me that we have three different uh, areas of the country here represented, three different circumstances, three different um, uh, 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 sensibilities, but there's so much in common Let's talk a little bit from our perspective and, and through your networks on what happens to rural children as well, uh, children who are living in other circumstances. Do you feel that, that these problems, these, these responses that you're representing, are they common across the United States or is it different for different areas of the country? Well, I'll speak to that because we actually started a program in a rural community in Texas in Navarro County, about 45 minutes away from Dallas a couple of years ago. Um, I think the issues, the importance of early childhood education are, are common across the United States, across 
you know, in every geography, rural, urban, et cetera. I think what we found is the a, a, a lower availability of other resources. And Child Care Group uses a holistic two-generation model. So we're educating children, but providing the support services for their parents. And sometimes in more rural communities, there are fewer resources there available. So we have to be creative and we have to try to look um, harder to find collaborative partners. Um, simply because there are not quite as many as there are in larger communities. And Bill, what, what is your experience when you, when you cross the Los Angeles landscape? It's, it's the most sprawling major metro in, in the United States. Do you find that, that parents, regardless of geography, are having the same kind of challenges? Yeah, and we're throughout California, and so we do see a lot of rural and um, tribal um, uh, environments. And if there's if there's one little silver lining to some of this is the pandemic actually allowed us to use that a technology uh, in some instances the first time ever to sort of reach out to these rural communities that are harder to get to. So that's been a little bit of a of a silver lining, but it's only gotten worse. I mean, um, you can imagine the stressors that were on these communities before, and now you add, um, as Tori was pointing out, this you know uh, uh, even harder to get resources and people and everything out there. So um, we're just Honestly, we're just starting to kind of reconnect. So we're just starting to see a little bit of what this has done um, in the past year and a half. But um, they're resilient communities and and um, it's been amazing to see what they've accomplished. But it's it's been extremely difficult. And, and we're going to try to continue to use technology to support them. But uh, yeah, I don't want to say hardest hit because it's hard to quantify, but extremely uh, difficult situation for them. We, we see, we've seen a little bit of that only because D.C. is literally you drive 50 miles in any direction and you're in some kind of a rural or farming area, whether it's in in, uh, you know, Loudoun County, Virginia, or uh, we've got folks who drive from West Virginia to work in D.C., um, and that our Eastern Shore in Maryland. So we're in a in a very uh, uh, urban, but within within an hour you are. And so we we hear about what's going on, and transportation is one of those big issues uh, when we uh, when we're talking about uh, rural uh, or less populated communities. Uh, as as providers are closing their doors and not reopening those individuals have to go further and further to try to find uh, quality childcare. And that's a real problem. Um, uh, and, and once again, that's a, uh, the system uh, has to look at how do we uh, prop up and support uh, locally based uh, childcare providers, uh, especially in our rural communities. Absolutely. There may be one uh, provider, you know, servicing a 15, 20 mile radius. And if that provider, right. closes, yeah, you've got a, a child care desert, um, right. which is really difficult to address. So if we were going to uh, and we're coming to the end of our time. So, uh, Tori, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, if we were going to uh, take collectively all of our representatives in Congress, all the senators, the President of the United States, the Supreme Court, and we were going to take them by the shoulders and shake them and say, come to your senses, we have to act. What would that look like, Tori? What would you tell them to do? Oh, gosh, what an opportunity. Uh, well, first of all, I do think that so many people are, are having a new appreciation for the importance of early childhood education. We've all been on Zoom calls where our colleagues have had a toddler on their lap. Um, we understand the importance of early education and child care to help support the the full participation in our labor economy. So I feel if we go back and look at models that, that our country has employed before, the way that the uh, the military has an excellent child care system, the way that we stood up child care centers went during World War II, there's several historical advantages of how we have tackled this issue effectively. But I think, and this draws back to a point Myrna raised a minute ago, the importance for me of getting 
child care centers back up and running is we've got to find a career pathway for early childhood educators so that they will choose this as a career pathway where there are opportunities to earn degrees and credentials and to earn a living wage. It is simply not acceptable that those who work in this industry are themselves eligible for public support. We need to value the importance of our early education and pay those educators accordingly. And when we have a system Amen. that we consider a part of the public good and not the private burden of a family, then we will see greater outcomes for early education and fuller participation in our labor workforce. It seems to me that that what you're all saying comes down to this. We need to really uh, take the heat down, take uh, get rid of the polemics and really look at the country. What is our responsibility as the adults here in cultivating a country that we can be proud of for the next uh, generations and for the next generations? Where do we invest? Um, we don't need to be arguing as much anymore. I think that if we, if we look at where we would want our children to be, the answer is, is, is quite obvious. It doesn't mean that resources are infinite. It doesn't mean that hard choices don't have to be made. There will be those debates, but we can, we can stop throwing darts at each other and start getting serious about where the country ought to be, and that will depend on children. Tori Manis, President and CEO of child care, uh, the Child Care Group in Dallas. Mino Peralta, um, President and CEO of Centro Nia in Washington, D.C. And uh, Bill Sperling, President and CEO of uh, Child 360 in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom. Thank your staffs. Thank your funders. Thank your boards for helping us here in America to navigate this very, very difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you so much.